We went through the argument, didn't we? How far did you go? Down? The end of it? Destroyed, nor could it have remained and admitted the heat. Quite true. 
In the same way, I think, if that which is without cold were imperishable, whenever anything cold approached fire, it would never perish nor be quenched, but would go away unharmed. That is necessary. And must not the same be said of that which is immortal? If the immortal is also imperishable, it is impossible for the soul to perish when death comes against it. For as our argument has shown, it will not admit death and will not be dead, just as the number three we said will not be even and the odd will not be even. And as fire and the heat in the fire will not be cold. But one might say, why is it not possible that the odd does not become even when the even comes against it? We agreed to that but perishes and the even takes its place. Now we cannot silence him who raises this question by saying that it does not perish, for the odd is not imperishable. If that were conceded to us, we could easily silence him by saying that when the even approaches, the odd and the number three go away, and we could make the corresponding reply about fire and heat and the rest, could we not? Certainly. And so, too, in the case of the immortal. <coughs> if it is conceded that the immortal is imperishable, the soul would be imperishable as well as immortal. But if not, further argument is needed. There is no need of that in this case. Nothing could escape destruction if the immortal, which is everlasting, could be destroyed. All, I think, would agree that God and the principle of life and everything else that is immortal can never perish. Yes, admitted by all indeed, by men, of course, and still more, I think, by the gods. Since then, the immortal... So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. All I think that Socrates would agree that God and the principle of life and anything else that is immortal can never perish. That's what they go. That's not an archive. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, principle of archive. This is Ados. That's the idea of the good idea. Ados. So it's a good day on the idea of life. The God and the idea of life. Depending upon how you want to translate Ados. Is that what you do, Barton? Yeah, you're just one. Since then the immortal is also indestructible, would not the soul, if it is immortal, be also imperishable? That must certainly be. <clears throat> then when death comes to a man, this mortal part, it seems, dies, but the immortal part goes away unharmed and undestroyed withdrawing from death. So it seems. Then CBs, it is perfectly certain that the soul is immortal and imperishable and our souls will exist somewhere in another world. I have nothing else to say to the contrary, Socrates, and I cannot disbelieve you in any way. Smoke. Um, but now if Simeus has something to say, or anyone else, it is well not to be silent. I don't know what better opportunity we could have. We can't put it off now. There is only this chance. If anyone wishes to say or hear more about such matters as this, Mm -hmm. 
we need a stimulus. I don't see how I can doubt either as the result of the discussion, but the subject is so vague and I have such a poor opinion of human weakness that I cannot help having some doubt in my own mind about what has been said. Not only that, Simeus, but our first assumptions ought to be more carefully examined, even though they seem to you to be certain. And if you analyze them completely, you will, I think, follow and agree with the argument, so far as it is possible for man to do so. And if this is made clear, you will seek no further. That is true. But my friends, we ought to bear in mind that if the soul is immortal, we must care for it, not only in respect to this time, which we call life, but in respect to all time. And if we neglect it, the danger now appears to be terrible. For if death were an escape from everything, <coughs> it would be a boon to the wicked. For when they die, they would be freed from the body and from their wickedness together with their souls. But now, since the soul was seen to be immortal, it cannot escape from evil or be saved in any other way than by becoming as good and wise as possible. For the soul takes with it to the other world nothing but its education and nurture, and these are said to benefit or injure the departed greatly from the very beginning of his journey thither. So it is said that after death, the tutelary genius of each person to whom he had been allotted in life leads him to a place where the dead are gathered together. Then they are judged and depart to the other world with the guide whose task it is to conduct thither those who come from this world. And when they have there received their dues and remain through the time appointed, Another guide brings them back after many long periods of time. And the journey is not as Telephus says in the play of Aeschylus. For he says, a simple path leads to the lower world. But I think the path is neither simple nor single. For if it were, there would be no need of guides, since no one could miss the way to a place if there were only one road. But really, there seem to be many forks of the road and many windings. This I infer from the rites and ceremonies practiced here on earth. Now the orderly and wise soul follows its guide and understands its circumstances. But the soul that is desirous of the body, as I said before, flits about it. And in the visible world for a long time, and after much resistance and many sufferings, is led away with violence and with difficulty by its appointed genius. And when it arrives at the place where the other souls are, the soul which is impure and has done wrong by committing wicked murders or other deeds to to those in the works of kindred souls, is avoided and shunned by all. And no one is willing to be its companion or its guide. But it wanders about alone in utter bewilderment during the certain fixed times after which it is carried by necessity to its fitting habitation. But the soul that has passed through life in purity and righteousness finds gods for companions and guides and goes to dwell in its proper dwelling. Now there are many wonderful regions of the earth, and the earth itself is neither in size nor any other respect such as it is supposed to be by those who habitually discourse about it, as I believe on someone's authority. What do you mean, Socrates? I have heard a good deal about the earth myself, but not what you believe, so I should like to hear it. Well, Simeus, I do not... They need the art of blocking to tell what it is. But to prove that it is true would, I think, be too hard for the art of Glaucus. And perhaps I should not be able to do it. Besides, even if I had the skill, I think my life, Simeon, will end before the discussion could be finished. However, there is nothing to prevent my telling what I believe the form of the earth to be and the regions in it. Well, that would be it. I am convinced then that in the first place, if 
the earth is round and in the middle of the heavens, it needs neither the air nor any other similar force to keep it from falling. But its own equipose and homogeneous nature of the heavens on all sides suffice to hold it in place. For a body which is equipose and is placed in the center of something which is homogeneous cannot change its inclination in any direction, but will always remain in the same position. This, then, is the first thing which I am convinced. Secondly, I believe that the earth is very large and that we who dwell between the pillars of Hercules and the river faces live in a small part of it about the sea, like ants or frogs about a pond, and that many other people live in many other such regions. For I believe there are in all directions on the earth many hollows of various forms and sizes into which the water and mist and air have run together. But the earth itself is pure and is situated in the pure heaven. <coughs> in which the stars are, the heaven which those who discourse about such matters call the ether. The water, mist, and air are the sediments of this and flow together into the hollows of the earth. Now we do not perceive that we live in the hollows. We think we live on the upper surface of the earth, just as if Someone who lives in the depth of the ocean should think he lives on the surface of the sea. And seeing the sun and the stars through the water should think the sea was the sky and should, by reason of sluggishness and feebleness, never have reached the surface of the sea and should never have seen by rising and lifting his head out of the sea into the upper world and should never have heard from anyone who had seen how much purer and fairer it is than the world he lived in. Now I believe this is just the case with us, for we dwell in the hollow of the earth and think we dwell on the upper surface. And the air we call the heaven and think that it is the heaven in which the stars move. But the fact is the same, that by reason of feebleness and sluggishness, we are not unable to attain to the upper surface of the air. For if anyone should come up to the top of the air or should get wings and fly up, he should lift his head above it and see as fishes lift their heads out of the water and see the things in our world. So he would see things in that upper world. And if his nature was strong enough to bear the sight, he would recognize that that is the real heaven and the real light and the real earth. For this earth of ours, and the stones, and the whole region where we live, are injured and corroded. As in the sea, things are injured by the brine, and nothing of any account grows in the sea. And there is, one might say, nothing perfect there, but caverns and sand and endless mud and mire, where there is earth also, and there is nothing at all worthy to be compared with the beautiful things of our world. But the things in that world above would be seen to be even more superior to those in this world of ours. If I may tell you a story, Simeon, about the things on the earth, that is, below the heaven and what they are like, it is well worth hearing. Now, Luke Socrates, you should be glad to hear this story. Well then, my friend, to begin with, the earth, when seen from above, is said to look like those balls that are covered with 12 pieces of leather. It is divided into patches of various colors, of which the colors which we see here may be regarded as samples, such as painters use. But there the whole earth is of, our, of, is of such colors, and they are much brighter and purer than ours. For one part is purple of wonderful beauty. And one is golden and one is white, whiter than chalk or snow. And the earth is made up of the other colors likewise. And they are more in number and more beautiful than those which we see here. For those very hollows of the earth, which are full of water and air, present an appearance of color as they glisten amid the, ver uh, amid the variety of other colors, so that the whole produces one continuous effect of variety. And in this fair earth, the things that grow, the trees, 
and flowers and fruits are correspondingly beautiful. And so too the mountains and the stones are smoother and more transparent and more lovely in color than ours. In fact, our highly prized stones, sards and jaspers and emeralds and other gems are fragrant are fragments of those there. But everything is like these or still more beautiful. And the reason of this is that there the stones are pure and not corroded or defiled as ours are with filth and brine by the vapors and liquids which flow together here and which cause ugliness and disease in earth and stones and animals and plants. And the earth there is adorned with all these jewels and also with gold and silver and everything of the sort. For there they are in plain sight, abundant and large, and in many places. So that the earth is a sight to make those blessed who look upon it. And there are many animals upon it, and men also, some dwelling inland, others on the coast of the air, as we dwell about the sea, and others on islands, which the air flows around near the mainland, and in short, what water and the sea are in our lives, air is in theirs. And what the air is to us, either is to them. And the seasons are so tempered that people there have no diseases and live much longer than we. And in sight and hearing and wisdom and all such things are as much superior to us as air is purer than water or the ether than air. And they have sacred groves and temples of the gods in which the gods really dwell. And they have intercourse with the gods by speech and prophecies and visions. And they see the sun and moon and stars as they really are. And in all other ways their blessedness is in accord with this. Such then is the nature of the earth as a whole and of the things around it. But round about the whole earth and the hollows of it, are many regions, some deeper and wider than that in which we live, some deeper with a narrower opening than ours, and some also less in depth and wider. Now all these are connected with one another by many sub subterranean channels, some larger and some smaller, which are bored in all of them. And there are passages through which much water flows from one to another as into mixing bowls. And there are everlasting rivers of huge size under the earth, flowing with hot and cold water. And there is much fire and great rivers of fire and many streams of mud, some thinner and some thicker, like the rivers of mud that flow before the lava of Sicily and the lava itself. These fill the, root, the various regions as they happen to flow to one or another at any, at any time. Now a kind of oscillation within the earth moves all these up and down. And the nature of the oscillation is as follows. One of the chasms of the earth is greater than the rest and is bored right through the whole earth. This is the one which Homer means when he says, far off the lowest abyss beneath the earth, and which elsewhere he and many other poets have called Tartarus. For all the rivers flow together into this chasm and flow out of it again, and they have each the nature of the earth through which they flow. And the reason why all the streams flow in and out here is that this liquid matter has no bottom or foundation. So it oscillates, waves up and down, and the air and wind about it do the same. For they follow the liquid both when it moves toward the other side of the earth and when it moves toward this side. And just as the breath of those who breathe blows in and out, so the wind there oscillates with the liquid and causes terrible and irresistible blasts as it rushes in and out. And when the water retires to the region which we call the lower, it flows into the rivers there and fills them up as if it were pumped into them. And when it leaves that region and comes back to this side, 
fills the rivers here. And when the streams are filled, they flow through the passages and through the earth and come to the various places to which their different paths lead, where they make seas and marshes and rivers and springs. Thence they go down again under the earth, some passing around many great regions, some passing around many great regions and others around fewer and smaller places and flow again into Tartarus, some much below the point where they were sucked out, some only a little. But all flow in below their exit. Some flow in on the side from which they flowed out, others on the opposite side. Some pass completely around in a circle, coiling about the earth once or several times like serpents then descend to the lowest possible depth and fall again into the chasm. Now it is possible to go down from each side to the center, but not beyond. For there the slope rises upward in front of the streams from either side of the earth. Now these streams are many and great and of all sorts, but among the many are four streams the greatest and outermost of which is called Oceanus, which flows round in a circle and opposite this flowing in the opposite direction is Acheron, which flows through various desert places and passing under the earth comes to the Acheronian Lake this lake the souls of most of the dead go, and after remaining there the appointed time, which is for some longer and for others shorter, are sent back to be born again into living beings. The third river flows out between these two, and near the place whence it issues it falls into a vast region burning with a great fire and makes a lake larger than our Mediterranean Sea, boiling with water and mud. Thence it flows in the circle, turbid and muddy, and comes in its winding course, among other places, to the edge of the Acrusian Lake that does not mingle with its water. Then after winding about many times underground, it flows into Tartarus at, the lower le at a lower level. This is the river which is called Help. Per rip. Somebody. Barbara. Padre Andres, what did you find? That's it. Say it again. Paris Phlegathon. Paris Phlegathon. You can call it the your yeah. next cat by that name. Yeah. yeah. That'd be a good my name yeah, for a my cat. My next cat, I will. Yeah. Pyrophlegathon. Yeah, it's a which is called Pyrophlegathon. And the streams of lava which spout up at various places on Earth are offshoots from it. Opposite this, the fourth river issues, it is said, first into a wild and awful place, which is all of a dark blue color like lapis lazuli. This is called the Stygian River, and the lake which it forms by flowing in is the Styx. And when the river has flowed in here and has received fearful powers into its waters, it passes under the earth and circling round in the direction opposed to that of Pyrophlygion, it meets it coming from the other way <coughs> in the Acrusian Lake. And the water of this river also mingles with no other water. But this also passes round in a circle and falls into Tartarus, opposite Paraphigion. And the name of this river, as the poets say, is Cocytus. Such is the nature of these things. Now when the dead have come to the place where each is led by his genius, 
Then they are judged and sentenced if they have lived well and piously or not. And those who are found to have lived neither well nor ill go to the Acheron and embarking upon vessels provided for them arrive in them at the lake. There they dwell and are purified and if they have done any wrong they are absolved by paying the penalty for their wrongdoings. And for their good deeds they receive rewards, each according to his merits. But those who appear to be incurable on account of the greatness of their wrongdoings, because they have committed many great deeds of sacrilege, or wicked and abominable murders, or any other such crimes, are cast by their fitting destiny into Tartarus, whence they never emerge. Those, however, who are curable, but are found to have committed great sins, who have, for example, in a moment of passion done some act of violence against father or mother, and have lived in repentance the rest of their lives, or who have slain some other person under similar conditions, these must needs be thrown into Tartarus. And when they have been there a year, the wave cast them out. The homicides by way of Cocytus, who those who have outraged their parents by way of Pyroplagian. Oh, <coughs> and when they have been brought by the current to the Acherusian lake, they shout and cry out calling to those whom they have slain or outraged, begging and beseeching them to be gracious and to let them come out into the lake. And if they prevail, they come out and cease from their ills. But if not, they are born away. <coughs> but if they are not, they are born away again to Tartarus and thence back into the rivers. And this goes on until they prevail upon those whom they have wronged. For this is the penalty imposed upon them by the judges. But those who are found to have excelled in holy living are freed from these regions within the earth and are released as from prisons. They mount upward into the pure abode and dwell upon the earth. And of these, all who have duly purified themselves by philosophy live henceforth altogether without bodies and pass to still more beautiful abodes, which it is not easy to describe, <coughs> nor have we time enough, nor have we now time enough. But Simeus, because of all these things which we have recounted, we ought to do our best to acquire virtue and wisdom for life, for the prize is fair and the hope great. Now it would not be fitting for a man to, of sense to maintain that all this is just as I have described it, but that this or something like it is true concerning our souls and their abodes since the soul is shown to be immortal, I think you may properly and worthily venture to believe. For the venture is well worthwhile, and he ought to repeat such things to himself as if they were magic charms, which is the reason why I have been lengthening out the story so long. This is this, then, is why a man should be of good cheer about his soul, who in, this, who in his life has rejected the pleasures and ornaments of the body, thinking they are alien to him and more likely to do him harm than good, and has sought eagerly for those of learning, and after adorning his soul with no alien ornaments, but with its own proper adornment of self-restraint and justice, and courage and freedom and truth awaits his departure to the other world, ready to go when fate calls him. You, Simeus, and Cebes, and the rest will go hereafter, each in his own time. But I am now ready, as a tragedian would say, called by fate, and it is about time for me to go to the bath. For I think it is better to bathe before drinking the poison that the women may not have the trouble of bathing the corpse. When he had finished speaking, Guido said, Well, Socrates, do you wish to leave any instructions for us about your children or anything? 
Anything we can do to serve you? It's what I always say for you. Nothing new. If you take care of yourselves, you will serve me and mine and yourselves, whatever you do. Even if you make no promises now, but if you neglect yourselves and are not willing to live following step by step, as it were, in the path marked out by our present and past discussions, you will accomplish nothing, no matter how much or how eagerly you promise at present. Um, we certainly try hard to do as you say, but uh, how shall we bury you? At sea, or in the fire, or in the earth? However you please. If you can catch me, and I do not get away from you. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you, brother. <laughs> yeah. I cannot, I, oh, yeah, I cannot persuade Credo, my friend, that the Socrates who is now conversing and arranging the details of his argument is really I. He thinks I am the one whom he will presently see as a corpse, and he asks how to bury me. And though I have been saying at great length that after I drink the poison I shall no longer be with you, but shall go away to the joys of the blessed you know of. He seems to think that was idle talk uttered to encourage you and myself. So give security for me to Credo. The opposite of that which he gave the judges at my trial, for he gave security that I would remain but you must give security that I shall not remain when I die, but shall go away, so that Credo may bear it more easily and may not be troubled when he sees my body being burnt or buried, or think I am undergoing terrible treatment, and may not say at the funeral that he is laying out Socrates or following him to the grave or burying him. For dear Credo, you may be sure that such wrong words are not only undesirable in themselves, but they infect the soul with evil. No, you must be of good courage and say that you bury my body and bury it as you think best, as it seems to you most fitting. When he had said this, he got up, went to another room to bed, Creed on followed him. They told us to wait, so we waited talking over with each other and discussing the discourse we had heard, and then speaking of the great misfortune that had befallen us. For we felt that he was like a father to us, and that when we went after them, we would pass the rest of our lives as orphans. When he got bathed and his children had brought to him, for he had two little sons and one big one, women of the family had come, he talked with them, Credo's presence, and gave them such directions as he wished. Then he told them to go away and he came to us. He nearly said so. They had spent a long time with him. He came and he sat down fresh from the bath. After that, not much was said, and the servant of the eleven came and stood beside him and said, Socrates, I shall not find fault with you as I do with others for being angry and cursing me. When at the behest of the authorities I told him to drink the poison. No, I have found you in all this time, in every way, the noblest and gentlest and best man that I've ever come here. And now I know your anger is directed against others, not against me, for you know who are to blame. Now, for you know the message I came to bring you, farewell and enjoy it there what you must as easily as you can. I burst into tears and turned and went away. Socrates looked up to him and said, Fare you well, too, I will do as you say. How charming the man is. Ever since I have been here, he has been coming to see me and talking with me from time to time, and has been the best of men. And now how nobly he weeps for me. But come, Credo, let us obey him, and let someone bring me, and let someone bring the poison if it is ready. And if not, let the man prepare it. But I think, Socrates, the sun is still upon the mountains and has not yet set. 
And I know that others have uh, taken the poison very late after the order has come to them. In the meantime, have eaten and drunk, and uh, some of them enjoyed the society of those whom they love. Do not hurry, but it's still time. Credo. Those whom you mention are right in doing as they do, for they think they gain by it. But I shall be right in not doing as they do. For I think I should gain nothing by taking the poison a little later. I should only make myself ridiculous in my own eyes if I clung to life and spared it. When there is no more profit in it, come, do as I ask and do not refuse. Upon Peter Meyer to the boy who was standing near the boy, went out and stayed a long time and came back with the man who was to administer the poison, which he brought with him in a cup ready for use. And Socrates saw him, he said, Well, my good man, <clears throat> you know about these things, what must I do? Nothing. Except drink the poison and walk about till your legs feel heavy and you lie down and the poison will take its effect on the soul. The same time he held the cup up to Socrates, he, he took it very gently, Equites, without trembling or changing color or expression, but looking up at the man with wide open eyes, as was his custom, said, What do you say about pouring a libation? some deity from this cup. May I or are not? Socrates, we prepare only as much as we think is enough. I understand that I may and must pray to the gods that my departure hence, hence be a fortunate one. So I offer this prayer and may it be granted. These words, he raised the cup to his lips, very cheerfully and quietly drank it. Up to that time, most of us had been able to restrain our tears fairly well. But we watched him drinking and saw that he had drunk the poison. We could do so no longer. But in spite of myself, my tears rolled down in floods, so that I was, ooh, so that I wrapped my face in my cloak and wept for myself. For it was not for him that I wept but for my own misfortune of being deprived of such a friend. Krieger had got up and gone away even before I did, because he could not restrain his tears. But Apollodorus, who had been weeping all the time before, then wailed aloud in his grief and made us all break down except Socrates himself. But he said, What conduct is this, you strange men? I sent the women away chiefly for this very reason, that they may not behave in this absurd way. All right have heard that it is best to die in silence. Keep quiet and be brave. Well, we were ashamed and controlled our tears. He walked about and when he said his legs were heavy, he laid down on his back, for such was the advice of the attendant. The man who administered the poison laid his hands on him and after a while examined his feet and legs and pinched his foot hard and asked me if he felt and such said no. Then after that his thighs, passing upwards, in this way, he showed us that he was growing cold and rigid. Again, he touched him and said that when it reached his heart, it begun. The chill now reached the region of the groin, and covering his face, which had been covered, he said, and these were his last words. Credo, we owe a cock to a shlepius. Pay it and do not, do not neglect it. That shall be done. But see if you have anything else to say. This question he made no reply, but after a little while he moved. The attendant uncovered him, his eyes were fixed, and Credo, when he saw it, closed his mouth and his eye. Such was the inequities of our friend, who was, as we may say, of all those in his time whom we have known, the best, wisest, most righteous man. We really whipped through that one, didn't we? Huh? Mm -hmm. right, we really whipped through that one. So how shall we pull it apart and look at it? Right. 
quite a bit of geography there. That's why it should yeah. be taught. That's why it used to be taught. Yeah. <laughs> what in the world is he talking about? What in the world? <laughs> what world is he talking about? Yeah, I, I, I don't recognize it. Remember what we were talking about Christianity before? Uh, it's kind of important. 107D. You see, this takes it completely out of that tradition. For the soul takes with it to the other world nothing but its education <coughs> and nurture. And these are said to benefit or injure the departed greatly from the very beginning of his journey. Nobody, huh? Nobody. <laughs> you don't have no body. Yeah. Well, any principles? Well, if you look at the end there, he was telling why he was drawing it out so long. Mm -hmm. And then it's a likely story, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly where it is. Yeah, keep going, though. Go to the next one. Well, i got to find the place. I'm going to find Page 391, though. It's a magic charm, right? Mm -hmm. Above it. Um, now it would not be fitting for a man of sense to maintain that all this is just as I have described it. Yeah. But that this or something like it is true concerning our souls and our bones. So it's not a physical thing? No. Right. It's a journey of souls. Mm -hmm. He ought to repeat such things himself as if they were magic charms. So he's giving them a charm, right? Eh? Yeah. Which is the reason. It's the one thing you have to start from. Oh. We can break it up, can we? be seen or viewed from the vantage point Yeah. 
say death is to earth as earth would be to sea. First, you have to define limits, mm -hmm. right? Because there are various places. So, <clears throat> what would be the vantage point? What's called the place to take your picture? Right. Little Kodak sign. Here's where you take your picture. Point the camera in this direction. Mm -hmm. Right? You've seen them. Right? You can't go anywhere without those little signs. I'll tell you, this is the best picture to take. Uh -huh. <coughs> Highest point. Yeah. Most picture of point? Uh -huh. Okay, let's start over if you'd like. 110B. Shows this description of the earth. Right? And we live in little hollows right? by lakes. Right? All fog and mist. In fact, we, we have all that, don't we? At 109. And uh, If you ever poked your head up. It's the feeder slime. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. right. Yeah, Wings. And real. Poke the head. Real. Yeah. Rising and lifting. <coughs> okay. The ball in there. Right. Terms. head up, he would see things in that upper world, if his nature was strong enough to bear the sight. He would recognize that that is the real heaven, the real light, and the real earth. in that world above would be seen to be even more superior to those in this world of ours. Okay, so from here, about the things of the earth. But it's below that. And I'll tell you, I like it. It's well worth hearing. The 
glad to hear the story. Well then, my friends, to begin with, the earth, when seen from above, Right. And there's a long description. Right. Okay. The earth when it's seen from above. What does that mean? Okay, that's from now. Poke your head up. Okay. It's said to look like, all right, and there's a long description of it. Is that as seen above or is looking back down? When, well, that's, From above. well, I'd certainly, when seen from above. Yeah, I understand from the from, yeah. I just wonder, yeah. you know. Well, I take it to mean in this image. Looking up then? Yeah, you, he's above, so he got above. Yeah, okay, that's how I think too, but I just wondered whether or not you're going another way with him. So he's looking at the, the superior model. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it would certainly be worth looking at that phrase. When seen from above. Yeah, from above. The ending. Hey, then. Uh, I no, no, uh, I know then. I know then. Yeah, I know then. The then ending is the from. Like, I, uh, so the direction is from above down. I know, uh, yeah. Yeah. Says if I may tell a story similar about the things on the earth that is below the heaven and what they are like is well worth hearing. All right, you can put it here. You can put it here. Can't you? Looking up or looking down. Yeah. yeah. Well, in any case, what you're seeing though is you're seeing the real. And this isn't meant to say you're seeing it from the underside. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's the force of this. Yeah, yeah, it was. Well, the force of that would seem to suggest you were from above looking down yeah. back into this. Yeah, into right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But this is the other, this is now outside of this, looking from a point outside of this light. Mm -hmm. Well, the only thing I could say would be that uh, um, if he kept his image, if he kept his image, he would have had to have floated a little bit further than sticking his head up. Yeah. Like hundred miles. So there's a heaven above even that, right? Mm -hmm. okay. If you were looking from above, all you'd mm -hmm. see was the bright upper region and not down into the hollow. Yeah. yeah, that's what it looks like, but watch what happens then. From this viewpoint, okay, from this vantage point, what do you see? Going down to heat. Huh? Oh, the real heavens, earth. Real earth, real heavens. What you see is the most brilliant Most brilliant light of being. Because nature's strong enough to bear its sight. Yep. Yeah. Okay. This whole description through those twelve patches ends with, in fact, a highly prized stones, sars, jaspers, emeralds and other gems are fragments of those there. But there, everything is like these, only still more beautiful. Where's the most brilliant light of being, Corey? I haven't seen it. There it is isn't there. 
Oh, I'm okay. saying what this passage is doing. Okay. Is describing something. Right. Okay. Right. The colors are much brighter and purer. White. Uh, there's a white. There's a gold. There's a white. Okay. But it's whiter than chalk or snow. Right. This whole description, glistening variety of colors, whole produces a vast, continuous, effective variety. Mm-hmm. It's more than one, too. It's transparent. Right. This whole paragraph is a study of light. Mm -hmm. And the earth is adorned with all these jewels, and lots of gold, silver, and everything of that sort. Okay, so that the earth is a sight to make those blessed who look upon it. Mm -hmm. That's enlightenment, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's what it is. That's a definition of enlightenment. If you can look upon that, that's enlightenment. Blessed. Uh Yeah. Right, right side. Home of divinity. Real speeches, real prophecies, real intercourse, dialogues with the gods, and prophecies and visions. Right. So I take a break at 111C, then he shifts. Such as the, na the true nature of the earth, taken as a whole. Right? That's as a whole. So that'd be my first break. Mm -hmm. Right then, in the hollows and the regions deeper, and then he goes through the interior of it all. Um, I don't know, raise a hypothesis for you. Have a little fun. Right? Is this a Kundalini trip? It sounds like it doesn't. It? Right? Yeah. The Kundalini trip? That's what struck me as all the rivers going in and out. Yeah. 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 The sumer canals and Idaho Pindalas. Yeah. Yeah. The great perpendicular path. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I said, what we do? Wouldn't you agree, Rod? That you should only people should only volunteer who have a background appropriate for the task. Yeah. And run. And what and whatever like if they had to do some pencil work, they should have pencils. Mm -hmm. And not volunteer unless they had paper to go with a pencil because one without the other before. Mm -hmm. Go along with that, Ken? Yeah. Huh. Paul, go on? Sure. Huh? That's okay. Bobby, go on? Sure. Huh? Well then if we need it. A sketch of this, and if we knew someone who had a Macintosh computer and had some interest in art, oh, yeah. <laughs> who do you think we should recommend to do the work for us and so that we can have a, that we can a have leather and ball color? I mean, look at that with colors, right? With twelve patches, yeah. B and C, a <laughs> mouse to help. Grid paper. What do you think? I mean, yeah. What do you think we should put it to a vote just to be fair? Sure. <laughs> sure. Just to be fair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wouldn't want to really. Bye. Bye. <laughs> It would be a lovely picture. Right? Okay. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe we should hear some objections first. Picture of enlightenment? That's right. Speak up. But I think, you know, oh, yeah. we do this or next have time. somebody that's back. been there yeah. and take a look at it. Bring the Macintosh and, and take turns. No. Uh, it might be fun if he goes once that they, um, <laughs> they do those uh, topographical uh, Computer. Yeah, we oh, make it and rotate it. Holographs. That's what Rod saw. Holographs, yeah. Yeah, like a hologram. That's what yeah. you're talking about Ooh. today. Uh, rotating those we drawings. We need to get to, to uh, put that on. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, so then why don't we come yeah, back to it then? Is there the any, uh, you know, like classic Kundalini text we could compare? With this text? Sure. Um, just for the sake of rubbing two things together and starting fire. I hear that's what Kundalini does. It's just sounding pretty erotic. <laughs> Rubbing two things together. Yeah, I'm starting yeah. to fire. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of those. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that's you what some brownie? people do with it. Then you get brownies, huh? Oh. <laughs> Your question, I don't know a simple one. Uh, if you could make Wood that is the only yeah. classic one, you know, the surfing power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you could make that on a videotape, uh, uh, you could do everything with it. Wouldn't have to draw it out. We could go over and watch it on the big screen TV. But then we get somebody from this. I mean, there's this uh, Kundalini freak up at the city. KFC, KFC, yeah. KFC, that's big. Oh, that let us go in there. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure, we're done. Sure, all you got to do is tell them why you want to use it for. Yeah. They didn't bother me using it as the jam. Yeah. Three o'clock yeah. in the morning. See you there, two dollars. Go ahead and drink the wine, eat the sandwiches and the fruit. Silent for this discussion, or oh, is it? Al. Oh, which one? Huh? Al Harabi. And has been into the text for a while, but he enjoys getting on. You know that poison goes through a trip. You know it starts at the feet and it goes, moves up, and when it reaches the heart level. That's you know, what the jailer said. But they said, "Well, okay." I mean, so there's some kind of there's a similar type of isn't there a parallel structure? Movement of the poison up through the body. Yeah, well, they're not they're not the nutrients. So yeah. we return to it next week. Well, for, yeah. I would say we look for parts, yeah. divisions, and circulatory system. Pardon? Good. 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 So I thought that we never reading this. Hey, wait a Wouldn't it be fair to get someone another volunteer? Do you think we should get another volunteer? No. A libation bearer? Oh. <laughs> that <laughs> might be. That might be. Do <laughs> you think there might be some? Uh, Artworks that might have attempted some. You think it would be? You think so? Yeah. yeah. Well, you'd think somebody in, that, in the history of this. Is there a university nearby? Uh, UC Irvine. You too bad we don't know anyone to go to. Yeah, it's, yeah. Wait a second. A student. <laughs> Nancy, Nancy goes, goes there. there. <laughs> oh. oh, Nancy goes there? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> My God. Look here. Wouldn't it be easier for her to simply go over to the philosophy department and take one off the wall? 
Yeah, I should think they just have one on the wall. They'd have one on the wall, like they have the School of Athens and things like that right on the wall. Sure. Yeah. Especially in San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. Right next to the poster of Hintica, who's going to be speaking there. <laughs> Hintica's going to speak there? Oh, there reminds me of a discussion with John McCain. <laughs> Remember that discussion on belief? Huh? On Hintica? Is that Hintica? Uh, I do believe so. Well, again, he was uh, one of the guys that I was with. Justified yeah. belief. Belief. Is that the guy had to Knowledge is justified belief. It may have been, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he did about theory of knowledge. Yeah, he did. Knowledge is justified belief. That's the bottom. I mean, that is really the pits, you know. That's the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's his bottom line to knowledge, right? That's the bottom yeah. line. That's the <laughs> bottom of the line. The only question they have is why they want to call it knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> being is like being dead. Maybe that's the top end of belief or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Seeing that's is right. being blind. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Do you think you need an assistant? An assistant? An assistant to do the checking out of UCI to see whether they're not the uh, several books there that have these full diagrams. Yeah. Illustrate. Yeah, you have to give me a name for my drama. <laughs> Is there anyone else that goes out there? <laughs> Barbara? Yeah, that someone that the camera might be on. Barbara? <laughs> <you know>? uh, <laughs> Barbara? <laughs> That's a splendid eye. Aren't you? Don't you do something with the Greeks over there? Uh, upon occasion, I do, certainly. Well, wouldn't that be a fitting task? Fitting with, with respect to what? With everything he's doing and this. And anyone sense. portray the myth? The geography. No, of the I know stuff. that. I know no, what just the assignment is, but just the Greek, that, that, that they would do that in the Greek department? No, no. I imagine someone could refer you to some volume. Oh, oh I'm sure they could. Yeah, oh, probably, oh, definitely. You know, it's a question you ever, whatever philosopher I might encounter. They probably studied the language is. out there and its geographical features, right? Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm sure. I mean, you get a real use of how the yogic, you know. the yogic terminology in the, in the field. Yeah, because sure they wouldn't want to develop empty etymologies, you know, that weren't based on classic authors, right? <laughs> and their use of terms. It would be interesting if William Blake did one. Yeah, Blake. Blake. Bill Blake. Raphael would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Raphael or Da Vinci. Who's that other one with the mustache? All with the Dolly. Salvador Dolly. Yeah, that's what he's going on. Except he had a good three dimensionality. Well, he's got his wife with crutches. Yeah. All the sweet All the sweet green icing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having the shape of his wife's head. <laughs> Someone left the cake out of the rain. There is a film on Blake. 